everybody. Welcome to Iran Book Show. We're broadcasting today from uh, from Krakow, Poland. So uh, again, apologies for the uh, background of uh, my hotel room. And uh, hopefully video will work today. Yesterday I was uh, broadcasting for The Blaze. I was broadcasting from uh, Warsaw. And uh, the uh, broadband was, was, I mean, Wi-Fi was just terrible. And uh, while the blaze, I could use wide internet, uh, I, I couldn't use it for the video, and therefore the video quality was was uh, was horrible. So hopefully, hopefully today will be better. Hopefully you'll be able to um, uh, to watch. Uh, we're we're streaming on Facebook. I see we've already got some people watching on Facebook. We're streaming on. YouTube, and let me just see if YouTube, YouTube seems like it's on. So there are some people on YouTube as well. Uh, in, let me just, uh, and we've also got uh, people on the uh, on the uh, Blog Talk Radio chat. So if, if for some reason you can't hear uh, well or sound isn't good, then uh, you can go on to Blog Talk Radio and uh, and listen uh, there as well. So uh, again, <laughs> welcome everybody. It's on the road. It's always kind of there's a million little things to do, and and I'm trying right now to figure out how do I uh, how do I get the YouTube chat to work uh, so I can actually uh, so I can actually watch it. But uh, you know it, it doesn't seem to. There doesn't seem to be an easy way for me to watch to to get the chat from YouTube uh, online right now. Oh, there it is. One second, one second. Hold on, hold on. We're working on it. We're almost there. Uh, and uh, for those of you watching YouTube, the uh, the phone number is wrong. The phone number being advertised on YouTube uh, as the phone number for this is actually wrong. Uh, so don't pay any attention to that. Uh, and uh, we are going to pause that, and now why can't I see the the chat on here? Let me just try one more thing. Uh, that doesn't work. All right, I am. All right, I'm going to skip it. So I'm not going to get I'm not going to get YouTube. Uh, all right, everybody's there. Uh, thanks for being there. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks uh, for being online, and uh, thanks for watching. Those of you on Facebook, I see there's a good good number of people on Facebook, and I can see your comments. Unfortunately, I cannot see the comments on, uh, uh, as I said, on YouTube. Those of you who want to call in, three four seven three two four three zero seven five, three four seven three two four. Three zero seven five, and the fact, and, and in spite of the fact that I'm broadcasting this from Poland, that is a U.S. number. So if you're in Europe, you're gonna have to dial the plus one. If you're in the U.S., just a straight dial. It's uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, again, uh, those of you who are having problems with the video, I encourage you to switch over to Blog Talk Radio uh, to uh, BlogTalkRadio.com um, and uh, and watch and, and listen. You won't get the video, but you listen there. Unfortunately, video from Europe uh, tends to be choppy. Uh, all right. Uh, you know, Simon Poland, because I thought I'd talk a little bit about Poland. I talked a little bit about Poland yesterday, but uh, that was for the Blaze audience. I think the, the objectivist audience, uh, there's some other things that are worth uh, talking about about Poland that I think I think are quite interesting. And uh, hopefully I won't be repeating too much of what I said yesterday. Uh, I will also um, I also want to talk about independent thinking. So independence, independent thinking. What, what does it take to be an independent thinker? What does it mean to be an independent thinker? Um, you know how many uh, how many people out there are, are, are true independent thinkers? Uh, you know what's what's really involved in being an independent thinker? So the virtue of independence, if you will, we're going to talk about that a little bit today, and may, maybe some other topics, and of course. Anything you want to discuss. So if you want to call up, and uh, by the way, when you call the number, you have to press one to let me know that you want to ask a question. So 347 324 3075. And once you get on the line, once you are listening on the line, 
you can ask a question. See, I said that, and, and of course, we've got our first caller with the uh, first question. So uh, so let's take that before I get into a discussion of... Uh, hold on. Hi, you're on the Yuan Book Show. Who's this? Hi, this is Jeff from Michigan. Hey, Jennifer. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You've got to speak up because I, I think it's hard, to, it's hard to hear you. Okay. Um, I was wondering, I know the United States is, is an inspiration to the rest of the world, like Eastern Europe and that. And some people say if the United States fell, it would take the rest of the world with it. Do you necessarily think that's true? Uh, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, so would the United States, if the United States went down, would it take the rest of the world with it? You know, it, I think if that happened today, then yes, I think it would. Uh, because I don't think the rest of the world has the the uh, intellectual fortitude to stand on its own. I don't think the cause of capitalism outside the United States today is strong enough. And if the United States fell or, or collapsed, I think that most people would interpret it as the failure of capitalism, the failure of liberty, this failure of freedom. And and a lot of people, a lot of people, just give up. So uh, yeah. I do think that today that is the case. Now, whether that's the case in the future, I'm not sure. Because what I think will happen in the future, as I see it right now, is that many of these countries are gaining uh, in terms of freedom, at least in terms of the intellectual foundation of freedom. Many of these countries have, a, have in some respect, a better understanding of, of freedom and the intellectual foundation of freedom than the United States does. And maybe 20 years from now, uh, other countries uh, will actually be in a better position to sustain themselves intellectually, even if the United States disappears. So I used to think it was the United States was everything, and and I don't anymore. I, I, I've come much more to the conclusion that the United States is going to be very difficult to turn around. It's like this massive, massive ship heading towards a waterfall, and turning it around is is almost impossible. And maybe it's easier to turn around one of the little canoes on the side and row the other way or one of the, one of the smaller ships on the side. But in any case, in order to prevent falling off the waterfall, what you need are intellectual ideas, what you need uh, are philosophical ideas, what you need is objectivism. And uh, it's still true that objectivism has the strongest hold in the United States, but I see that as shifting. And who knows in 20 years whether that will be true. So yesterday I got into this argument. I, I, this is the second time I've met this guy in uh, Warsaw. And uh, he, every time I meet him, his whole goal is to convince me that Poland is going to become the beacon of freedom for the world. That in 20 years it would be Poland, that it would be a free place, that Poland will be the center of objectivism. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that he's an objectivist, but he's very sympathetic to objectivism. And he is convinced that it is, it is going to happen in Poland. And he's got a whole argument of why and, and the history and openness and their experience with socialism and the, 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 that they, they are going to make it. And maybe, maybe, they are obje- you know, we have three, this, this, this first year, I think of the 20-something students in the Objectivist Academic Center, Three are from Poland. That's a great sign. And, uh, and, and many others are from other countries around the world. And so who knows uh, where the revolution will happen? Who knows where objectivism will take root? Uh, it, it's more and more and more difficult in the United States. And, and partially I'll get, to, I'll get to talking about that in terms of when I talk about independent thinking and, and conventional thinking. And being conventional, and I think Americans are conventional in, in, a, in a deep sense. Life is too comfortable to break that conventionality. Or too many Americans are conventional, uh, even within the objectivist movement. So, I, you know, I think in the future it might be different, even though today I think it's the United States and only the United States in many respects. Does that make sense, Jennifer? Yes. Yeah, hopefully there will be freedom somewhere in the world. Yeah, working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> I need a lot of help, so you guys out there who are in the position to help, help. Well, then. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks for calling. All right, so if you want to join the conversation, 
3075. And, and by the way, talking about help, um, as some of you know, I've launched a Patreon site. Patreon is a, a website where you can go and support me, uh, support the radio show, uh, support all my efforts, support my speaking, support everything that I do. And uh, the nice thing about Patreon is it makes it very easy, I think, to make monthly contributions. You can't, take, you can't make one-off contributions. I guess you can commit your monthly contribution and then cancel it the following month, and then it would only be one contribution. But it basically gets you to make uh, monthly contributions. Now, I, I, I want to be clear on a few things. One, it's not tax deductible. You're not giving the money to the Ayn Rand Institute. It actually goes into my personal account. However, I am committed to using that money to market the show. So any money that goes into that account does not actually go into my consumption, but goes into hiring marketing people, hiring editors, hiring engineers, hiring people to make this show better and to market this show more professionally and more effectively. Uh, so that, 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 that's the Patreon website. Uh, and just to be clear, also, it's, it's important. Uh, so, uh, some of you know this, but my position at the Android Institute has changed. I'm no longer the CEO. I'm no longer the president. I'm no longer an executive at the Android Institute. So, I do not get a salary from the Android Institute. I am now the chairman of the board, and I get compensated from the Institute for the speeches that I give on their behalf and for help I provide them with fundraising. So, anything I do uh, above and beyond that, like, uh, like this radio show, is not being funded by the Andrean Institute. So the equipment, the marketing, uh, all, the rest of the, uh, all the rest of the the activity that the radio show requires, my prep time, um, my assistant, the editing, the putting it up on Facebook, the putting it up on, Twitter, on, on, on YouTube, the editing into short videos, all of that uh, I do, either, either with the work of volunteers or people that I pay in, in order to do that. So... Um, so anything you give us on Patreon goes to the show and, and goes to making all of that activity possible. There is no, I mean, I, I do have um, a substantial, if you will, benefactor who provides a significant funding towards the show that makes the show really possible. But above and beyond that, anything that we do more has to get your support. So um, I don't want to do too much of this, but I am going to periodically mention this. Please go to patreon.com slash Euron Book Show and, and, and contribute to our efforts. Uh, do this in addition to what you do to the Ironman Institute. And again, don't be free writers. You listen to the show. I like, I like it when NPR does their fundraising because they talk about the, the value people get from the shows on NPR and uh, that they should contribute. Now, I don't contribute to NPR because, hey, they get my tax money. And as long as they get tax money, I'm giving them nothing. Uh, but if they stop getting tax money tomorrow, I'd actually give them money because I get a value from them. And if my tax dollars are not paying for that value anymore, then I'd be happy to pay for it from my own pocket. And I hope you guys feel the same way. Certainly none of your taxpayer money is going to fund me quite the contrary. Um, my taxpayer is being taken away. My, my, my income is being taken away from me by the government through taxes, which makes it um, necessary for me to ask you guys to support the show that you are benefiting from. So I'm asking for uh, anything uh, for free, value for value. Uh, hopefully, I'm providing some value. Some of you think more. Some of you think less. But if you're listening, it's not a negative value. So even if you listen and disagree, it must be a positive value because it, it feeds your uh, disagreement and it gets you thinking and it gets you angry and whatever it is uh, you're valuing, I'm hoping you will support that. I'm hoping that you will choose not to be a free writer. Go to patreon.com slash your own book show and, and make a contribution. Anything from $2 and we get all kinds of books at two to five, 10, 25, 50, 250, $5,000 a month gets you a whole bunch of stuff. I think I think at five thousand dollars a month, you get to uh, you get backstage passes to all my talks and you get to travel around the world with me. So uh, <laughs> I don't know why anybody would want that, why anybody would want my schedule, uh, but um, if you contribute five thousand dollars a month, that's what you get. All right, we have another caller, so uh, I guess there's a, there are a lot of questions today. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? 
Uh, my name is Logan. Hey, Logan. How's it going? Pretty well. Um, so you kind of gave me a great segue about disagreeing and getting a positive value. But um, for the most part, I agree with you on everything except for one thing, which I consider to be one of the most important issues, and that's the war in the Middle East. Sure. Um, I, I'm it seems so like relieved. you're pretty... Uh, I'm, I'm so relieved I'm because I, I thought I'm so relieved because I thought you were going to say Trump and I was going, Oh no, I don't want to talk about Trump today. So, um, <laughs> no, no, we agree on Good. that. Uh, the war in the <laughs> okay, Middle East, though, it seems like you're pretty, uh, I hate to use the word, but hawkish on, on the Middle East. And, um, yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard of Scott Horton, but he wrote a book called fool's errand time yeah. to end a war in Afghanistan. So yeah. I tend to be of the mind that the whole thing is a waste of time and they're not really a threat to us anyways except well, to waste our I mean, own money I, I, and lives. Yeah, no, so so I was never particularly, I was never for a ground war in Afghanistan. I'm not for staying there. I've never been for staying there. I, I think it's a stupid war and, and a useless war. Um, I, I'm, I, I was, I'm not really, I was never really uh, for a war in Iraq and building democracies and staying there and building it. But the idea that they're not a threat to us is, is, is just wrong. And 9-11, I think, proved it. And, uh, and, and the, the many one-off terrorist attacks that have happened since then are further proof of that. And I, indeed, I think that if not for the amazing work that our intelligence services do, uh, there would be many, 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 many more uh, terrorist attacks against the United States. They are committed. They want to kill us. Uh, they want to do everything they can to destroy us. Luckily, they're very weak. And I think, and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not surprised. So, so they're very weak and, and they can't really hurt us, but they want to, and they can do a lot of damage and they can kill a lot of people. So um, I, I don't believe in letting people kill me. So if somebody wants to kill me, uh, I, I, you know, I think it's incumbent. It's indeed the only job of the government to figure out how to stop them from killing me. Uh, and, and I think we haven't done that. So I, I don't support having troops in Niger and having troops in 120 different countries and, uh, and doing all the nonsense and stupidity that we actually do around the world uh, in the name of uh, supposedly defending ourselves. When we're not defending ourselves. We're just, in many respects, making things worse. So we might agree on that. But no, if somebody flies airplanes into buildings and tries to kill, they try to kill 40,000 people, they, they, they only killed three, only in quotes, only killed 3,000 people, that's a declaration of war. Uh, you know, and, and, and you got to find the people responsible and you got to find the people who, are, who make it possible and who fund it and support it. And, and you got to crush them. You got to destroy them. Uh, there's, it, it, it's a default on the responsibility of government not to do so. What do you find objectionable about that fact? No, I, I agree with that. And I think that we had done that sort of in an inefficient way. I mean, we could have. I'm sure you're not going to like this, but there were options to negotiate with the Taliban for um, Osama bin Laden, and we could have but just come in publicly and yeah, <laughs> made a big uh, made a big thing of first, it. But but the fact is, we did negotiate with the Taliban, and the Taliban said no. But the point is that Osama bin Laden is not the problem. The point is that uh, Islamists, in the name of the same ideology, Osama, Osama bin Laden uh, acted in. Uh, have been killing Americans for uh, since 1979, at least to, to, throughout the 1980s, the 1990s, and we just ignore it. So uh, Osama bin Laden was one. That's interesting because I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, Osama bin Laden was one occurrence and needed to be taken care of. I and mean, if the Taliban had handed him over with his deputies and his men, and they could have been tried and hung and 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 done away with, then then fine. That would have been one problem taken care of, but there are, a mil you know, there are thousands of people willing to replace Bin Laden, and there are thousands of uh, Islamist terrorists that have been killing Americans. Uh, they're still around. They're still killing Americans, even though Osama Bin Laden, for example, is dead. You can't solve the problem by going after specific individuals. I mean, that is that is the fallacy that unfortunately many libertarians fall into because they don't have an understanding of the ideology and the motivation of the people who attacked us on 9-11. You could have killed Osama bin Laden, it would have made no difference 
to the to the fact that people would have continued to try to kill Americans and to work hard uh, to, to kill as many Americans as possible. And again, I go back. The number one job of the U.S. government is to protect the lives and property of Americans. And if somebody is trying to kill us, it's their job to stop it. And then the, the strategic question is, how do you stop it? And I have an idea on how to stop it, but I'm willing to consider other ideas of how to stop it. But the key is, it's the job of the government to stop it. Right? Yeah. Um, something that you've said in the past is that um, evil is impotent, and the only way that they can hurt good people is to use the tools that good people make. I'm sort of paraphrasing there, but something That's right. to that effect. That's right. Something that and, too. Yes. Um, like 9-11, they flew our planes. They couldn't actually do anything without our technology. Sure. And sure. in the 70s, you brought guns, up 79. But, any of this stuff. Now, that, now, that other way um, is true of Islamists. It wasn't true of the Nazis who built their own weapons and built their own systems, but relied on science that was a product of the Enlightenment. So it's not that they it's, – it's, it's not a direct effect. It's, it's a fact that they have weapons. They have oil. They have money. That's have the point resources. that I'm trying to get to is that yeah, um, okay. in Afghanistan in 79 through 89, we were funding their war against Russia trying to turn it into Russia's Vietnam. And then sure. they turned around and used those weapons that we gave them to attack but, us. And yeah, they couldn't really attack us is, if we weren't over on their yeah. land. That's not true. None of that is true. So they didn't use the same weapons to attack us uh, because they didn't need to. While we provided some funding to the Afghans to fight the Soviets, we didn't provide the bulk of the funding. Of the, of the funding. We didn't provide the bulk of the money. And post-Soviet Union, once, once the Soviets lost in Afghanistan and left, we stopped funding al-Qaeda, and yet they continued to get millions and millions and millions of dollars um, to buy weapons and to establish training camps and to establish uh, uh, networks all around the world. And that is my point. The, the way to stop them is to eliminate the support that they get. And the support that they get, as I've said many, many times, and I'm not going to get into it too much here, is comes from two countries. It comes from Iran and Saudi Arabia. And our job is to eliminate the network that supports people like Al-Qaeda so that they can never kill Americans again. That's the goal. That's it. It's not to take over right. the country. It's not, it's, it's not any of that. One last, I'm sure that there's other people so, who want to talk, but I just want to yes. say one last thing yeah. about um, sure. ISIS that um, I'm not like one of these people who, you know, talk, hates America or like want to talk bad about it, but I don't think it's being objective to ignore the fact that we also fund terrorism indirectly through ISIS. We had John McCain saying we need to quote unquote fund the good rebels, the good ISIS rebels. And then look how that turned out for us. So well, but again, uh, it's been kind again, of short-sighted to, in the way that we yeah, deal with it. Yeah, but you have to study what I, – I, I, I agree somewhat with what you did, but, but we did not fund ISIS. So, so we, we, have to, we have to think clearly about these things and not get caught up in, in generalizations and not get caught up in the way some of the media spins these issues. So, and some libertarians spin these issues because it's just not true. So uh, there was a civil war in, in Syria. Um, the existing regime is a clearly anti-American regime because it's aligned with Iran and therefore anti our interest. Uh, there were there were these uh, Sunni fanatics uh, that were not in our interest that they win. So we chose, I think, poorly and stupidly, we chose to fund what we considered moderate Sunni Arabs who would fight the regime and hopefully replace them with a democratic, wonderful Western government in Syria. Uh, we didn't fund terrorists. They weren't terrorists. They were fighting. They were, they were fighting against an illegitimate government, an illegitimate government of Syria. Uh, it turned out, not surprisingly, if you know anything about the Middle East, uh, that they were much more sympathetic at the end of the day with ISIS than they were with anybody else. And many of the weapons we supplied them landed up with ISIS. But we were not funding terrorism with the idea of terrorism we were fighting people fighting against an illegitimate regime now i don't think we should have ever been there now there's another sense which again nobody talks about nobody in the media talks about in which we created isis we created isis by going into iraq and and uh, fighting a stupid war which we ended up supposedly winning by handing sunni sheiks large suitcases of cash 
and they agreed to stop fighting us in exchange for that cash and, and help us actually eliminate certain elements within Al-Qaeda in, in Iraq. Ultimately, that cash was all used to, uh, to fund ISIS, uh, ISIS's takeover of uh, northern Syria in the name of, of, the, of, of the Sunnis. So those Sunni sheiks took American cash and basically funded ISIS. So, it, it, to, and, and to that extent, I agree. I mean, our policies in the Middle East have created a disaster, but the solution is not uh, pacifism. The solution is not, all right, we'll just come home and, and do nothing and let them kill Americans, who cares? The solution is to regroup, to uh, acknowledge all the errors we've made in the past, to identify clearly who the enemy is, destroy that enemy and come home and, uh, and, and let them rot, right? But, but you can't come home until you actually destroy the enemy and, and, and make it clear to them what the consequences are of killing Americans. And uh, it, then if they want to engage in civil war and kill each other, I have no problem with that. I mean, I think it's sad whenever people are killing each other, but, but fine, let them do it. It's their problem. We should not intervene. And that's what I said about Syria all along. Sunni radicals yeah. killing Shia radicals and the other way around. Uh, the longer it goes on, the safer Americans in Israel are going to be, which is what I care about. I don't care. I care about the safety of America. All right. Cool. Well, I, I don't know if you've read my book or Elon Giorno's book, Winning the Unwinnable War. I have yeah, good. Okay, so uh, you know I'm not going to make any more arguments than I made in that book. And those of you who haven't made that read that book, you should all go read the book. Thanks for calling. Right. I Thanks appreciate for, it. And I, Thanks for and, I pre- yep. and I appreciate it that you uh, you agree with me on other issues, even if we disagree on this one. Um, all right. So uh, as I said, I'm in Poland, and. Uh, one of the things that that makes this country, I think, interesting is the fact that it is – I was just talking to a, 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 a local objectivist here, and, and to one of the things that makes this interesting, that makes Poland interesting, is the fact that it's probably the most religious Euro, uh, country in Europe, that it actually is very Catholic. It's certainly the most Catholic country in Europe, maybe in the world, and uh, probably the most religious country in Europe. And – that combination of religion, um, hatred and distrust of, uh, of socialism because of the communist past, a educated public, uh, a decent educational system, certainly as compared to the United States, but then again, almost everybody has a decent educational system as compared to the United States, uh, all come together to kind of create, I think, an interesting, uh, an interesting mixture, if you will, uh, in um, – you know, in Poland, uh, it's it's a place where there seems to be a lot of energy around the idea of liberty, about the idea of freedom. Uh, there seems to be, uh, uh, but at the same time, that energy is somehow connected to Catholicism and uh, and to religion. And I think ultimately, although again, the person yesterday was trying to convince me that Poland will ultimately be the beacon of uh, freedom in the world, was trying to convince me that young people in Poland are actually not that religious, not that Catholic. Maybe that's true, maybe it isn't. I don't have enough experience in Poland to be able to give you an accurate assessment of whether that is true uh, or not. So, um, uh, you know, it, 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 really is, it really is hard to tell uh, how religious young people are. So yesterday I gave a talk in, uh, in Warsaw on inequality and a good Q&A, and you can find the talk on YouTube, by the way, the, the, the funds you, you provide on Patreon not only help this show, but also help, help us get better at, at producing the various YouTube channels and YouTube videos. And, uh, so the talk is on YouTube, and you can search for it. And uh, there were a lot of questions, like they always are in Poland, that bring up religion. And I, I have to say, I was kind of on fire yesterday and, and really went after, went after Catholicism. And as and what was interesting was there was obviously a certain portion of the audience that was very uncomfortable with the fact that I was going after, um, after Catholicism. And then, and then there was another portion of the audience that was cheering, that was clapping, that was excited, that was engaged, 
um, and uh, and that uh, you know it was much more uh, that liked the fact that I was attacking religion because it's so unusual for them to hear anybody uh, you know attacking religion. So uh, so so they seem to have viewed it much more positively. Uh, so. Anyway, I encourage you to go listen to the talk. I think it's I think it's good. I think this dynamic between uh, Catholicism and liberty, uh, I think uh, I think you'll find it interesting as well, and uh, and you can see it kind of play out. You can see it play out in uh, in the talk yesterday. So uh, so go have fun, watch it, and uh, if you have any questions. Or any comments, you can call up the show today. And uh, I am here listening. Let's see, where am I exactly? All right, sorry about this. Computer issues. All right, there we are. Uh, you can call up 347 324 I noticed somebody called in and kind of dropped off and called in and dropped off. So you're gone. So I don't see you. 347 324 Three zero seven five, and when you do call in, press the one button uh, so that I know that you want to talk about uh, that you want to ask a question. All right, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we will be right back. The Ayn Rand Institute fights for the future. Throughout history, people all over the world have been fighting tyrants in the form of kings, dictators, and governments who propagate the immoral idea that your life does not belong to you. This is why the Ayn Rand Institute is important. We promote Ayn Rand's philosophy, objectivism, that not only teaches you as an individual the principles needed to live a happy and successful life, but also the moral foundation for striving to achieve such a life. Ayn Rand said that anyone who fights for the future lives in it today. Join us in that fight. Go to AynRand.org today. So one of the things that I've noticed uh, in people generally, and uh, but even in objectivists, is a certain conventionality uh, in thinking, a, a, a certain framing of the issues that is really comes to us from uh, popular culture and from the world around us, and uh, lacks what is it? Lacks a certain uh, Lacks objectivism, Lack, lacks the, the, the originality of thought, the, uh, the, the real philosophical thought that Ayn Rand brings to, uh, to any kind of debate, to any kind of issue that, that is out there. And, you know, maybe, maybe we can start with this foreign policy issue because I think it's a, it's a good way to illustrate this. Because I noticed this after 9-11. People were fixated kind of into two modes that were defined, in a sense, by the American left and the American right. Uh, they were fixated into the mode of, which is typical left, and, and many libertarians hold, but it but is kind of typical of, of what you think of as left. And that is, we should negotiate. This is a police action. Let's not overdo it. There's no, you know, we don't want to go to war. And, um, you know, ultimately, if you really think about it, it's kind of our fault because we did all these bad things in the Middle East. And it's just coming back, you know, it, it, you know, just just back to bite us. And uh, and, you know, let's let's hold off and let's uh, really uh, it's not jump to anything and let's not uh, let's not get too aggressive and uh, let's uh this is all can be managed with kind of police action and diplomacy. And, uh, and remember America's not exceptional. And that was kind of one approach. And I think a lot of objectivists, some objectivists were attracted to it, uh, particularly the ones who lean more libertarian, if you will. And, uh, but, but most were not for good reason. And the other approach was, you know, this is war. We got to invade Afghanistan. We can bring them the American values. We, we will then invade Iraq because Saddam Hussein is somehow involved. We don't have any proof that he's involved, but he's somehow involved. I promise you he's involved. And hey, if we invade Iraq, then we have bases from which we can invade Iran. 
and this is just going to be a, 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 you know, this is just going to be a good thing. And we're going to rally all the troops and we're going to form a coalition of the willing and we're going to get other countries to support us and coalitions are good. And uh, America, America never does anything wrong. And, you know, we just, we just need to beat them and we need to, we need to go over there and teach them a lesson and everything will be fine and everything will be fixed and we'll be great. And George Bush is fantastic. He's a wonderful leader. And did you hear what he said in his inaugural, you know, did you hear what he said in front of Congress? He called it axis of evil. He said something really cool about foreign policy. We've been waiting for a leader to say evil about something for a long time. And he finally said it. So we're going to be supportive of Bush. And this is exciting. And yay, let's rally around him. And, and I think a lot of objectivists were, were, were seduced, if you will, by that point of view, that pro-American, but very conservative Republican and very pro-Bush uh, kind of perspective. And both are wrong. Both are not how to think about the world. Oh, allowing your thinking to be shaped. And, and, and it's hard to get away from this, but to be shaped by the so-called experts. The experts on the left, the experts on the right, the people who preach this, the people who preach that. And it's very dangerous in the world in which you're in today to be, if you will, swayed by or, to, or to, to, to accept the, uh, what the experts have to say. Because the experts are biased. Uh, they're biased by a lousy, rotten philosophy. And our politicians are biased. They're biased by a lousy, rotten philosophy. And the left, the left is terrible. It's influenced by, it has influences by postmodernism and, and, uh, and, and, and socialism and it, it's just a complete disaster, you know. It's 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 Kantian uh, subjectivist, complete uh, complete failure. No lack of self, no no self esteem. A, a perspective on America that is anti American at its core, and at its heart. And naturally, objectivists reject the left. Because, it, you know, it's so irrational and it's so anti-American and it's so anti-values, which is even deeper, right? It's anti-values. So they reject the left. And for too many, what is left is the right. Uh, you know, they appear to be pro-values. They appear to be pro-American. They appear to be tough. They appear to have a America first pro-American foreign policy. They appear to know what they're doing. They, they write great books. They, they, they give good interviews. They have a whole, you know, they're, they're on television all the time. They, they have a sense of history. They have a, a, a certain, they claim admiration for the founding fathers. And, and it seems very appealing. But it's not. Because the right in America today, the, the conservatives, the, uh, the, the Republicans, have been just as corrupted by bad philosophy as the left has. Part of it, part of, uh, you know, part of it is, is uh, they have just been just as influenced by Kant as the left has been influenced by Kant. They've been influenced by what goes on academia, just like the left has been influenced by what happens in academia. They, they take it in a completely different direction. And if, if you read my book on uh, neoconservatism, uh, my book with Brad Thompson, actually Brad Thompson's book that I am a mild co-author on, you will see how corrupt, intellectually corrupt, the right is. The right is platonic. The right is, uh, is anti-objective knowledge. It's, anti, it's anti-reality in a fundamental sense because they either believe in religion they either believe in the importance of religion for everybody, or they believe that maybe there's no God, but everybody needs to believe in a God because that's the only thing holding society together. You can see it today in, uh, in Dennis Prego who says, you know, we'd all be murderers and rapists, uh, rapists if there wasn't a God because there would be no morality and we would have no incentive to actually behave like human beings if not for the fantasy of a God. So the, it's the fantasy of the God that makes us human. 
that makes us mall. And you see Ben Shapiro, who I, I respect and, and sometimes even admire what he does and what he says, saying basically the same thing. That it is a God, a supernatural being, a fantasy that makes human beings human, that makes human beings moral, that makes it possible to be good as a human being. Now, if you hold that view, you certainly have a right to hold that view. I don't trust anything you say. I, I, I don't trust you. I, you know, so you are not an alternative source of real knowledge to the left. The left, you know, doesn't believe reality is what it is. The left doesn't believe in human reason. But that's exactly what religion is. It's a negation of objective reality. Reality is what God wants it to be. It's a rejection of fundamentally of reason because it's the elevation of revelation. It's the elevation of authority. And this is really important because the right is big on authority. It's the elevation of, of authority above facts. So the alternative to the left is not, again, modern American politics. It's not the right. But yet the right has this massive appeal. And it's hard to reject both the left and the right, on everything, on every issue. But you have to do it, because they're both wrong on every issue. Because think about the foundations of what they consider knowledge. It's not reason. It's not fact. It's not evidence. It's not reality. And again, the foreign policy example is exactly that. Nobody stopped to ask the question, who did this? Who's really behind it? Who's actually funding it? Who's actually at the source of it? How does Al Qaeda even exist? Where does the ideology come from? You know, the, the, the right came up with all kinds of theories about democracy in the Middle East, and we just need to go over there, and there's a yearning for freedom in every human being. But that's the kind of stuff religion teaches. You know, we know, or we should know, that it's not enough to have yearning. That freedom requires knowledge. That freedom required a whole sequence, historical, ideological sequence in Western history that led to the idea of freedom. Freedom did just pop out because people have yearning for freedom. And if people have yearning for freedom, why is freedom so rare in human history? Why has freedom only happened in, in, in a few places in, in, over a very, very short period of time? Why isn't freedom common? in human history. It's unbelievably unusual to be free if you're human. Well, <laughs> not that animals are free in, in the sense of which we mean. But, so, uh, but everybody bought it. Everybody bought it. And everybody was rushing to compliment George Bush on, on his analysis because he said a few lines that were good. A few lines that were good, nothing else matters. And, and, you know, we'll get to this, but you're seeing exactly the same thing today. A president says a few lines that are good, writes a, a good letter, um, um, and everything else doesn't matter. And, and the context and where he's getting his knowledge and, and what exactly is actually going on in the world it, it, it doesn't matter. Objectivists are different. We're fundamentally different. And to be to be an objectivist means you really have to think for yourself. And in the world in which we live in today, that's very difficult. We're busy. We've got a lot going on. There's, there's, uh, there's a lot of pulls and tugs on our time. And then when we look at the media, it's biased, biased left, biased right, but always biased. You pick up a history book. How do you know that what's in the book is true? You know, by what standard? When you know people are lying, when you know people are deceiving, when you know people are making stuff up, how do you know when you read a book that it's true? And, 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 and you, you know, you look at the Middle East and it's a complete disaster. It's a complete mess. How, do, how are you going to make any sense of the place? Well, we've got political leaders. They project strength. They project confidence. So let's go with them. That can't be the right solution. That can be the solution of a thinking individual 
that can be the solution of somebody who really cares about truth and about knowledge, but it's hard. It's hard to find truth. It's hard to attain knowledge. It's hard to figure out who knows what they're talking about and who doesn't know what they're talking about. As objectivists, as, as, as thinkers, as people who are interested in truth, it's hard. It's, it, you know, in the world we live in today, it's very, very hard because, as I said, <laughs> who do you believe? Who do you trust? What are your sources? And again, too many objectivists, I find, because they know the left is wrong. And I agree with them that the left is wrong. They know the New York Times is biased. And I agree with you, for the most part, the New York Times is biased. They, they, they know that CNN sometimes makes stuff up. And I agree with you, CNN does sometimes make stuff up. In other words, they know the left is bad. They know the left is evil. They know they reject the left. So they take the right as an alternative. And they stop using their critical thinking skills when it comes to the right because it's just too hard. Now you're challenging everybody and everything. You're challenging the left and the right and their experts and all their sources of media and everything. And where do you go from there? You're stuck. You're at a dead end. You go nowhere. So that's the quandary we live in today. And, and I, I find too many people going what I consider the lazy route, which is going to the anti. Whoever's anti-left is their ally. Whoever's anti-left has real knowledge. Whoever's anti-left you listen to whoever's anti-left, all they have to do is say just a few things that make sense and you bought in to an entire agenda. And that's not independent thinking. That's not reason. That's not rationality. That's not what it means to be a thinking, independent human being. All right, we're going to take another quick break. We'll be back right after, right after this. 2017 marks the 60th anniversary of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Twelve years in the writing, it is Ayn Rand's masterwork. Despite being published six decades ago, the novel continues to gain recognition and profoundly influence business leaders, thought leaders, and a growing number of political leaders. Its presence in today's culture cannot be denied. The fascination with Atlas Shrugged persists because it grapples with the fundamental questions of human existence and presents radically new answers. Whether you're an adoring fan who wants to add this new addition to your personal library, or someone who wants to read the book for the first time to see what all the fuss is about, pick up your copy of Atlas Shrugged today. An updated cover for the mass market edition of the novel recently hit stores. Check it out. You can order your copy today on Amazon. All right, we're back. And uh, for those of you on the, on the chat, uh, if you'd let me know what the sound is like, and those of you on Facebook, I'm curious how the video, what the video quality is. Um, it's laggy. I, I don't understand why I've got, a, uh, I've got a wired internet connection going into my laptop, and um, I did a speed test on it, and the speed test was all good. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, the internet and its quirks. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure why video is so bad. All right, we're going to take a quick question before I get back on my, on my uh, discussion of independent thinking. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Greetings, Dr. Morgan. This is Skylar. Hey, Skylar. How's it going? It's going pretty well, sir. Good, uh, good. So what's this up? Is kind of like the, like, is this kind of like the blaze, like the general question period? Mass, the general question it isn't, but what the hell? You're on, you're on. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, disconnect you. Just ask away. <laughs> okay. I was on a roll right. there. I thought you'd ask a question about what I was talking about, but go ahead. No, uh, I want to know your thoughts on uh, women's pursuit and participation in infantry roles within the United States gov- um, military. <laughs> so is this just the infantry roles, or is this combat more generally? Combat, infantry, the whole gamut. So, so I'm actually I'm actually opposed to women in combat, um, and uh, because I think I think that uh, very few women. Um, oh, put it this way: I'm opposed to women in combat primarily because 
I think that in combat, in the trenches, uh, we have to rely on our instincts, on, on, on automatized knowledge and automatized action. And I think the fact is that most men automatic response to having a woman next to them is to be protective of her. Now, you could argue that's a bad thing. You could argue that's being socialized into us. You can argue we shouldn't be like that. I, you know, I, I don't even want to go there. But the fact is that that is the reality. The reality is that when a woman is in a trench or when the woman is in combat next to you, I think that most guys, most men, response is to be protective. And I guess that can be overridden through training, but I don't think it's easy uh, because I think it has some biological um, um, basis. And the question is then, um, does that interfere with combat operations? Does that actually uh, pose a threat to the unit, to the mission, to what is actually going on? And again, I suspect, and I don't have strong feelings about any of this, that, uh, that it is, that it does pose a threat and it does slow you down, and it does ultimately, not because of the woman, but because of the men's response to the woman. Now, I also think that very few women are strong enough physically uh, to be part of particularly elite combat units, but, but that's empirical. There, there might be women who are strong enough as long as they don't moderate the rules for them, as long as they don't make it easier because it's a woman. So if you really test into it, then fine. But again, I do think it slows people down. I do think it makes it, it makes it difficult. And, um, and I would be against adding women to in combat roles uh, to the military. Absolutely. That makes sense. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. for clearing All right. It always makes sense when they agree with me. Thanks, Skylar. I appreciate the call. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you want to call in with, uh, I guess, uh, either questions on the topic or random questions, that you might have, call in 347-324-3075, All right, so we're talking about kind of what it takes to be an independent thinker. And, and I think objectivists, objectivists have to question everything. They have to question everything they know, and they have to question everything that is told to them by the people, in, if you will, in, in, the, uh, uh, you know, in the media, in politics, in, at the universities, uh, they have to question everything. You have to be on the premise that nothing you hear is necessarily true. And just because somebody says something you agree with doesn't mean that the next thing they're going to say is going to be true. Um, so, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really hard. It's hard to be an objectivist in the world in which we live because it requires a, a, a first handedness in terms of doing your research, in terms of figuring out what the facts really are, in terms of figuring out how the world really works, in terms of figuring and integrating all of that into your philosophical ideas, which presupposes that you actually know what your philosophical ideas are because you've studied them properly. To be fully an objectivist, you have to study the philosophy. You have to understand it. You have to really, really, really think about it, and you have to integrate all new knowledge into that philosophy constantly. And it takes a lot of work, and it takes constant work. And it takes constant diligence. You can't let up. Because the world around you is fundamentally hostile to your ideas. Particularly when it comes to intellectuals and when it comes to politicians. They are hostile to reason. They are hostile to reality. So anything they do, anything they say, has to be taken with suspicion. And therefore, you constantly... On God, you're constantly struggling to figure out what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false. And I find that very, very few people actually do this well because it's really, really hard. I mean, Ayn Rand was a genius, 
If you think about Ayn Rand's commentary, and, and I encourage you to read her essays from the 60s and from the 70s where she comments on political events and what's going on in the world, it's almost never conventional. It's never, oh, William F. Buckley would have said that. Oh, Rand Paul would have said that. Oh, that sounds like Ronald Reagan. When you read Ayn Rand, it doesn't sound like anybody. It doesn't sound like anybody. It's a completely different perspective. She's integrating the facts of reality differently than what other commentators are doing because she's using a philosophical method that they are not. And she is not accepting conventional knowledge because it's not knowledge. It's conventional, but it's not knowledge. So an objective that's have to develop is the ability to be independent thinkers, to think for themselves. And this means a, I think, a really unique approach to thinking, to living, um, and, and to committing oneself to, to certain ideas. It means a total, uncompromising focus on reality, on reality, on facts rather than on other people. Most people look to other people for knowledge, for affirmation, for their self-esteem, for everything. Objectivists, if you're a real truth seeker, you don't look for other people. Your primary orientation, your primary orientation is life, is towards reality. It's towards facts, the way they are. And, and this is, again, why it, I'll shift to politics. In politics, I don't expect left or right because I, I don't belong in either one of those tents. And I don't support either one of those tents because I'm oriented towards reality. And sometimes somebody on the left might be right and sometimes somebody on the right might be right. But more frequently, both people on the left and the people on the right are all wrong. They're all wrong, even if some of what they say might sound right. So George Bush was wrong about the war. He was wrong about the axis of evil. He was wrong about his whole approach to 9-11. Because instead of asking a fundamental question, instead of looking at reality, instead of looking at facts, he basically adopted a kind of conventional wisdom, the conventional wisdom of the, of, the, of the foreign policy establishment, which basically said Saudi Arabia is our friend. Iran has nothing to do with this because, you know, they're Shiites and, and uh, you know, why mess with Iran? It's too complicated. Nobody, no, you know, it's, it, it, there's, there's, no way to, there's no way to win there. And by the way, the Iraqi people, they're secular because Saddam Hussein is secular and they've been ruled by a secular dictator. So we can go in there and, and we can reshape the country and it doesn't take much and we could, we could beat them very easily militarily and, and they'll embrace us and they'll love us and they throw flowers in our way and we just give them democracy and they will flourish. And then what will happen? Then what will happen is the rest of the Middle East will look at Iraq and say, oh, wow, look how well they're doing. We want to be like you. We want to be like them. And then there'll be revolutions all over the Middle East all over the Middle East to become like Iraq, to adopt freedom, to adopt liberty in all these countries. Because finally, they would have seen an example that works, which is Iraq. And a lot of people go, yeah, that makes sense. I see that. I see that. And my response was, and, and I'm not just trying to toot my own horn, but, but, but I, think, I think it was original because I don't think anybody else said this. I said, but wait a minute. Doesn't the Middle East already have an example of a free country that has democracy and, and, and that uh, where people vote and they have uh, respect for individual rights and property rights and, and, and if the country's thriving and the country's rich and the country's doing well? Israel. Why is it that they can't take an example from Israel, but they will take an example from Iraq? Oh, because Iraq's Muslim. Like they are. Well, if they're that tribal, if they're that primitive, if it's that religion-oriented, then they're never going to learn anything. You don't learn that way. So if they won't learn from the Israeli example, why will they learn for any example? 
Nobody was saying that. But that's going to fundamentals, that's going to essentials, that's going to reality, that's going to the facts. Or take the whole idea of, of, of Iraq again. We talked about this earlier, about Iraq becoming a democracy. Well, if you understand the nature of religion, if you understand how committed they are to religion, and by the way, this idea that Iraq was secular, where did that come from? Nobody really ever explained where it came from because, because Saddam Hussein was, was secular and because he oppressed the religious tendencies within his culture. That it made the people not religious, but anybody who knows anything about the Arab world knows how religious the Iraqis were, knew that half of the population, over half of the population was Shiite and had, had deep, deep roots in Iran. And, ha- and if you know the history of the Middle East, you know that Iran has always played a massive influence on Muslims in Iraq and in the rest of the Middle East. The Iranians tend to be the intellectuals within Islam. Uh, uh, these are just facts. This is just historical knowledge. And it's all ignored. It's all ignored. But if you understand any of those facts, you know that Iraqis were not eager for freedom as we understand it, but they, they wanted to manifest their own, their own religiosity. They wanted, you know, they wanted a Shiite Republic like Iran. And the Sunnis hated the Shiites. And while m- many of the Sunnis were relatively secular, they were a minority in the country. And you can go on and on and on and on. Facts. Facts. And then, of course, what are the requirements for freedom? What are the requirements for actually attaining liberty? And, and the, the idea that they would write their own constitution where they have none of the context for knowing what liberty and freedom and, and a proper government require. Now, any of that. Facts. Just facts. Completely ignored. Completely ignored. And so many people supported the Iraq War. So many people supported the Iraq War for so long. Because they weren't actually connected to facts, to reality. But were caught up in, well, this is the right doing it. This is George Bush doing it. He said some good things. He seems tough. He's got generals. We love the army. The generals are saying it. And a reliance on authority, a reliance on other people, a reliance on opinions of people who do not share respect for facts and reality. All right. Um, if you want to call in, 347-324-3075. I'll take questions on pretty much anything. But I'm particularly interested in this idea of, of being unconventional and, and what that means, being unconventional when thinking. Uh, press 1 once you call, so I know that you want to ask a question. So I know I've got one caller on the line right now who is not pre- – oh, there he goes. He's pressed the 1. All right. Hi, you're on the Iran Brook Show. Who's this? Hello, Dr. Brook. Yes, hi. Hi. Uh, so on, on your group, uh, there was a, a question about OCD, and, you know, I, I wanted to ask what your thoughts were on OCD and uh, other anxiety sort of disorders <laughs> and how, how, how that interacts with the, uh, with, with the validity of, of the census. Well, I mean, so, so let's, let me say first, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not an expert on these things, so whatever I say, uh, you know, take in a sense with a grain of salt. Um, I don't think it has anything to say about the validity of senses. All it says is you've got a dysfunctional mind. That is, there's something wrong with the mind. It's either a disease or it's a self-inflicted thing, but, they, but whatever it is, the mind is not working properly. The machinery of the, of the mind is not working properly. And as a consequence, it is affecting your sensory experiences. So that says nothing. You can't learn anything about a healthy mind from studying a sick mind. Uh, you know, if a mind is sick with OCD or schizophrenia or, 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 or uh, clinical depression, that is not reflective on the state of a normal mind or a normal human being and therefore is not reflective of the validity of the senses. It's still true that a healthy mind sees reality as it is. And indeed, I would say more than that. 
my, I, I don't know enough about these, these uh, inflictions, but many of these inflictions are the senses see what they see, and you actually know what you're seeing, but then there's an emotional overlay onto that that says, no, no, somehow that pillow over there on the bed, which I'm seeing just as it is, is a threat to me. So what, what I think most of these mental diseases are about is the interpretation, not the actual seeing, not the actual information you're getting from the senses. And l- unless you're delusional again, unless you're actually seeing things or, or in schizophrenia, right. I think sometimes you see things. But if you're actually seeing reality, it's the interpretation of that reality. Oh, my God, my, that, that, that pillow is going to come at me and attack me. Um, or, or, or I just fear it. So I don't even think it's going to attack me. I just see the pillow and I feel fear. You know, those are psychological problems, but they have nothing, zero, nada, to say about the validity of the senses. That makes Thank sense. Thank you, Dr. Brook. Sure. Yes, sir. And, and, let, me, and let me just say, I, I don't know exactly where a lot of these mental diseases come from, but I'll, I'll speculate that there are probably two sources. One is a, a disease, a, a, a malfunction in, in a biological malfunction in the way our, our, our brain works and our mind works, that this is the consequence of that malfunction that could be inflicted by either, either a genetic problem within our brain or a virus or who knows. I, I just don't know. But something that's biological. But I also think bad thinking can lead to it. And I think particularly in a culture that teaches bad thinking, that, that encourages low self-esteem, that... that uh, uh, kind of separates thinking from emotion and celebrates emotion above thinking and that uh, denounces reason and denounces purpose and denounces self-esteem, it doesn't surprise me that we're seeing a, a, a significant increase in psychological uh, and psychiatric problems among people. Uh, Dr. Peacock has talked about this quite a bit and in, in, I think Johnny can't think or uh, it, it, the idea that once you debilitate the human mind through our educational system, once you make it difficult for people to think, to be objective, to, to approach reality objectively, then you're leaving them naked before nature and you're leaving them in a, in, 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 without the tool by which to deal with the pillow, to deal with reality. And that nakedness, I think, uh, brings about anxiety and it brings about mental problems and, and if all the way possibly to schizophrenia. So I think that our educational institutions, our political institutions, but primarily educational institutions and our intellectuals are, are, are feeding this, um, you know, this mental health problem that we have in the world today. They're, they're making it much, much worse. Because the tool, our tool for living, our tool for self-esteem, our tool for finding purpose, our tool for everything that we do is, 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 is reason. Once you negate reason, you're negating what it means to be a human being and you're opening up uh, Pandora's box in terms of the, the ugly possibilities that, of the things that can happen to, to a human mind. So yeah. while I think some of it is physiological... I think a lot of it is psychological, but psychologically inflicted on us by a culture that has no respect for human reason. That's All right, thanks for the doctor. question. Yeah. What's that? Whoops. Are you still there? You still there? All right, he's gone. All right. Uh, okay, we've got a bunch of other callers. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hi, Iran. This is Peter from Germany. Hey, Peter. How's it going? Good. Um, I have two questions for you. One is on independent thinking and the other would be an update on the theory I presented to you a couple of weeks ago, if you remember. Yeah, let's start with independent thinking. Okay. um, Have you ever heard of a new uh, cosmological theory in physics called the electric universe? No. 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 Uh, Because um, it is one of the... uh, most encouraging instances of independent thinking I have discovered recently uh, because there's a growing group of physicists in, um, and they are, who have come 
completely fed up with the uh, common cosmological interpretations of, you know, relativistic physics, quantum mechanics, Big Bang, and all that stuff. Okay. And they have, and they have actually, um, uh, and that's why they have become interested in an, uh, in an alternative theory, which is called the electric universe. Now, now unfortunately, I'm not knowledgeable enough to, um, in physics to judge the electric universe theory on its own merits, but sure. if, you just, if you just watch these guys, uh, in terms of the arguments they make against uh, the mainstream physicist uh, point of view, it's extremely intriguing uh, from a philosophic point of view because they refuse to degrade physics to this, uh, you know, math, giving mathematical descriptions of phenomena in the modern Kantian tradition. Interesting. They, in Interesting. St instead, instead they, they are really hungry, and you can see that, they're really hungry to ex explain existing entities based on observational evidence. And as a result of this philosophic shift, you will see a lot of Greek ideas popping up again. Uh, fascin it's really fascinating. For example, they, uh, they advocate the idea that time is in the universe and not the other way around, you know, which, Good. which, makes, wow. the which makes the idea of uh, a Big Bang impossible and ridiculous. Yep. Yep. And, and they also... They also want to get rid. Of, uh, they're also getting rid of um, all these absurdities, you know, like black holes and quasars and all this stuff that's put out by modern physics, which are, you know, just really ridiculous phenomena, which they use. Well, I don't know if black holes are ridiculous phenomena. I know some objective physicists. Yeah, too. yeah, I, I didn't, I did, I didn't think so either. I, I just accepted it uh, as, you know. Uh, yeah. because, because yeah. that's what I've been learned. But but ever since I I watched a lot of their lecture materials, it, it's um, because well, it, it, the, the, yeah. Well, one of the, one of the things about independent thinking is to be objective about your thinking, and, and I just don't know, right? But I, I I will say this: it's encouraging to see people thinking outside of the box, coming up with new theories, uh, and and going back to the facts, going back to reality, re-examining the data. And, and re-evaluating it, there are a lot of philosophical problems with modern, at least the interpretation of modern physics. And if anybody is re-looking at that, that is a value. And I think we have generally too few people in the world in which we live who are real independent thinkers. I don't think there's anybody in politics today who's an independent thinker. I think everybody there is basically a second-hander of one way or another, one form or another. And I think the only, one of the reasons I always say that I love Silicon Valley and I love entrepreneurs and I love technology is because I think that's one of the few places in the world where you actually see real independent thinking, people thinking about something completely new based on the fact of reality, easily testable in reality, and, and, and breaking paradigms. I mean, I, I, I think Uber is a fantastic example of just that. I think what Steve Jobs ultimately did at Apple with, with uh, iTunes and the iPod and, and ultimately the iPhone is another example of that. But, but the whole technology industry is built in this idea that, of shattering paradigms. Think of what Netflix did. Um, you, you don't have to sell television with advertising. You could sell television uh, just as a subscription basis. And, uh, and, 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 but, and you can do it online and you can do it, you can do it all these ways. And everybody, everybody said they were wrong and the stock market took these massive hits and they persisted and they stuck with their ideas and they, they completely changed paradigms um, that, that, people, that people held on to and believed in. And, you know, so, I, so again, I, I've, even though I know people hate me for it because they're all leftists in Silicon Valley or, or quite leftists in Silicon Valley, I just love the fact that they're independent thinkers when it comes to, to, to their productive activity. And I wish they were independent thinkers when it came to politics and philosophy. But, hey, I'll, I'll take a little bit of independent thinking as better than none at all. Yeah, what, what really uh, struck me is the, uh, with, this, with this theory in physics is um, I, I just stumbled upon this YouTube channel called Thunderbolt Project. And it's a, it's a quite a popular channel, you know, a couple of tens of thousands of subscribers. And, you know, you, uh, how you always in your talks, you, uh, you talk about how the, some of the rewards you get from teaching is see the lights go on, you know, yep. Uh, yep. In, the yep. eye, in the eyes of your, of your listeners. And if you uh, read the comment sections in some of those videos uh, regarding the electric university theory, you can see 
you know, uh, students of physics, you know, just completely lighting up. They just are ecstatic about it. I, I, I don't great. know. Uh, it's That's because, great. You know, because they, they're so fed up about all this orthodox stuff that's been, you know, preach, uh, that physics has been preaching for 100 years and that has led to no serious I mean, results let's... at all. Well, it has led to a lot of results. Let's not overblow this. I mean, I mean, the fact is that, that we use quantum mechanics all the time. The, the, I, not, the, not the interpretation, but the actual mathematics of it. And, 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 and we use a lot of the knowledge we've discovered in physics overall. But, but yeah, cosmology and stuff like that is, uh, some of that has been less practical. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, but yeah, yeah this is great. I mean, it's always good to hear that somebody's doing something new. Uh, and and, and hopefully, hopefully it's true. And uh, and based on good stuff. No, I, 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 I on your new I, I, I on your theory. Oh, so, oh sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's just um, so so. Uh, you remember I I I, I was um, talking about the devastating effects on secular societies once they engage in large scale self immolation through civil war and. Um, and I had to revisit that theory because there's a lot of, uh, after looking at some more of the evidence, I still think that's uh, true, as far as I can tell, for ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Yeah. But I can no longer say that for modern Europe because modern Europe has something that the ancients did not have, and that is the United States. Yep. Um, yep. And, as long, right. and as long as and as long as there is a secular, you know, a functioning secular alternative in existence, then uh, you don't. You, I suspect you don't have to go down that road, um, but if you just imagine what the 20th century and our modern world would look like if there had been no United States, I think Europe would look very similar to uh, Greece after Alexander or Rome, you know, in the later. Oh, no, I know. I think you're right. I, I think we would ha we would have had a dark ages, and it would have been a complete and utter disaster. I think the United States not just saved the world because it it, it won the wars. But it saved the world because it presented a, a real alternative. I, I think Asia would still be dirt poor, uh, and subsistence farming, dying of starvation. I think Europe would have declined into another dark ages if not for the existence, put aside the military and economic power, but just the existence of the United States as a model that, that could be emulated, that could be looked up to and, and respected. And uh, yeah, it's, it's completely changed the projection of history. All right, I, I need to move on. I've got, I've got. It looks like more callers. Thanks, Thanks. for taking my call. Yeah. Sure, and keep me updated on uh, on the theory. It, it really is fascinating. Hi, you're on the Run Book Show. Who's this? Hey, uh, I called in earlier, but I have a completely different question. That's fine. Okay. Uh, I have a question about Ayn Rand. Okay. Um, do you think that she loved her literature the way that her characters loved their trades? For example, like Howard Rourke and his architecture. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it, not that she loved the literature; she loved the writing, the the, the process, the the creation, the, the everything about it. I think yes, I think she loved it exactly like Howard Rourke loved architecture. I think she loved it exactly like uh, like Dagny loved railroads. And I don't think I actually don't think she could have created those characters. I don't think she could have given life to Dagny or to Rourke if not for the fact that she experienced it herself. She understood what that meant. She understood the effort it took. She understood the, the energy, the mental focus, the mental requirements that it took. Um, and, uh, and she also understood the joy of success, the joy uh, that, that was entailed in, uh, in, in achieving when you actually succeeded something. Also, you have to remember that Ayn Rand wanted to be a writer from the age of nine, just like Dagny wanted to be a railroad executive since she was a little girl. So I think she also understood that striving towards um, a, a, a career, a, a, a goal throughout one's life. So she, she had a, a very Dagny-like perspective on what she was doing. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. That's nice. Although I think really, uh, in other regards, she was more like John Galt, but in a sense that she didn't, you know, she would have joined the strike earlier. She got it, whereas, uh, whereas Dagny doesn't get it. Ayn Rand obviously gets it because she writes it. But so it's an interesting, it's interesting, but no, no question. She loved what she did. She, 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 she really, truly loved it. 
Uh, and um, anyway, yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's it's great to have a profession and have something that you do that you that completely immerses everything that you do in life that that you can completely embrace that you completely dedicate to yourself that you can achieve in and you can gain you know all the values that that such a pursuit allows you to gain great thanks for calling sure my pleasure um all right we're getting questions from across the board here 347 324-3075-347-324-3075. And then you have to press one if you want to ask a question. You can pretty much ask a question about anything. We're, we're, we, I have been talking about independence and, and the lack of independent thinking, a, 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 a general view kind of that's conventional uh, uh, among people and, and even among objectivists um, and, uh, and warning against it. And again, to be independent is really, really, really hard. It is not, it is not easy because it requires one to be, to be doubtful about, about uh, facts as presented by other people, to be doubtful about the analysis as presented uh, from other people, even people that one trusts in one realm because people are so compartmentalized and so mixed, they might be completely untrustworthy in another realm. You can see that uh, with a lot of intellectuals and, and TV hosts, talk show hosts, and people like that. It means when you read history, having a very, you know, a critical eye and a critical mind and trying to read more than one book on one period and one time and one personality, trying to get as much as possible to original sources uh, because it's hard to trust the, the people who are, you know, in a sense that we're reading, who are secondary or third level sources, uh, it, it requires real intensity. And, and again, I'm going to use myself as an example only because I know myself. So it's an easy example. So now after 9-11, I'll use 9-11 as an example because it, it was a period in which, similar to today, I'd say, I, I was being attacked by many objectivists, by, certainly by many conservatives, by people on the right. I would, I would go out there and give talks attacking George Bush and attacking our foreign policy and be told that I was a traitor because, uh, because I wasn't supporting the president and it was a time of war and you're supposed to support the president in a time of war. And, and, and because if I think back at what it was that I did and other people at the Ironman Institute did, it was that we looked at reality. We looked at the facts. We weren't buying uh, just because an authority said something. We weren't buying just because somebody who – you know, had a degree and had a, a long history in explaining the Middle East said something. I mean, partially, I don't trust them because look, look what a mess the Middle East is. So if you're such an expert, how come you didn't see it all coming? Um, but, but the first thing I did, I remember after 9-11, is like ordered like 20, 30 books. And, and I, myself and others, at the institute, we just read and read and read and tried to figure it out because it's not obvious. And what I find astounding is how many people who don't read, who don't know much about a topic, but have heard, I don't know, Sean Hannity or, or, or a couple of other people comment on it, think they know something, think they know something so well or so astutely that they can actually, or they've read one book or they've read two books or they've read an article by, they've read a couple of blog sites or Wikipedia online and they're an expert and they're passionate and they'll argue. And they'll condemn you. Completely not objective and a lack of real independence. Um, so read, 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 read. And don't just read stuff online. And don't just read the stuff that, you know, I don't know, you found an article on Breitbart that you like because it attacked Hillary Clinton and you hate Hillary Clinton. So now everything that Breitbart puts out, you read. Read widely, read extensively, read all different sides of an issue. Try to find objective knowledge, but it's hard. It's hard to find objective knowledge, but try. Talk to people who actually have an experience in the topic, whether it's technology, whether it's politics, whether it's foreign policy, whether it's the economy. I mean, this, I, I, it boggles the mind. It truly boggles the mind. 
How many people today have a false view of trade? It's, it's just it's just unbelievable. You know, they, they haven't studied economics. They haven't really looked at the economic arguments. They accept superficial, basically zero-sum world-based ideas from all kinds of experts that go out there that say, oh, if China's subsidizing their industry, then it's unfair. And as a consequence, we should be subsidizing our industry or we should put tariffs on importation of their goods for, which is all nonsense and has been debunked a million times, a hundred million times. And there's a science here called the science of economics. And, and to hear objectivists talk about American jobs as if there's some collectivistic right to a job because you're an American and as if somebody else is stealing because you had a right to it, your job. It's just mind-boggling to me. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling to me that, that uh, uh, there is all this knowledge out there, real knowledge, data, science, real information, real experiences of people. And, but more than that, a way of thinking that Ayn Rand taught us, starting from the individual, starting from concrete, and the impact that concretes have on an individual. And all that is out the window because, you know, because it's easy. It's easy to be conventional. It's easy to get caught up with the masses, with the, with the group think. And if people, particularly people of authority, say it enough times and a few people publish it in a few articles, then it must be true. And it makes kind of logical sense. But you know what? Most falsehood make kind of logical sense. We're not about kind of logical. We're about the truth. And the truth is often complex. The truth is often non-intuitive. And if you don't believe that with regard to economics, I encourage you to read Economics in One Lesson. Economic One Lesson talks about all the non-intuitive, non-straightforward, not obvious, not clear-cut, clear, not clear-cut, obvious that things that just pop into your head. Examples in economics where it's much more complicated, where you have to dig deeper, where you have to think, think and figure stuff out and look at secondary and third level and fourth level consequences. And yet, every Joe Schmo out there has an opinion about trade. Really? I mean, it's a complicated topic, a complicated topic that's been solved, a complicated topic that economists have figured out, a complicated topic that's been debated for 250 years, a complicated topic that there really is no disagreement about or no conflict about but i guess there is because people are fine being ignorant but having opinions i mean i'm okay if you're ignorant i'm ignorant of a lot of things i'm ignorant of science i'm ignorant of this electronic theory i'm ignorant of a lot of things but then i don't claim to be an expert and i don't try to talk about it but people are so passionate now about things they know zero about zero passionate about what China's like, but they've never been to China. They've never talked to a Chinese person. They haven't read any books about China. But, you know, they've heard some commentaries online about it, and they've heard President Bo- uh, uh, Trump talk about it, and they've, uh, I don't know, and they know we have a trade deficit, and now they're experts on China, and they, 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 they are going to comment and let us know what they think about China and everything else. All right. So I, I mean, you see, you see this, um, you see this in every topic, in every field, foreign policy. Everybody has a point of view about what's going on in Saudi Arabia. But what's going on in Saudi Arabia is complicated, and it's complex. And even people who really know don't know, because there's a lot of uncertainty, and yet people are commenting. And and, and social media today makes us all experts because we we can comment in 144 characters. We can say exactly what we think. Who cares? What do you know? It's not what you think. It's what you know. And based on what? And is it based on facts? Or is it based on a tweet you read five minutes ago? So being objective is important to thinking, period. But independence, what do you know versus what other
accept know or don't know? What do you know versus what you've heard, what you surmised, what you feel like? What do you actually know? And it's is when you take that knowledge and you integrate it into the rest of your knowledge, what is the result? Is there real knowledge there? That's how partially how we know how we find contradictions is we try to integrate it with other stuff we know and we go, bam, something, something contradicts. Take tariffs, for example. I mean, so, okay, so it sounds like tariffs, if, if, if the Chinese are cheating and therefore uh, there are fewer American jobs and that's bad. So, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm for tariffs, but then, okay, but if, if, if for, for tariffs, does that mean that I'm not taxing Americans if they want to buy something from China? But wait a minute, I'm against taxes. And I'm against government intervention in the choices that individual Americans make. And, and whose individual rights are being, are being obstructed here? Who's right? What have I taken away from somebody using coercion? Where have I used force against somebody? And there's no answer to it. And, and obviously something's wrong here, right? So maybe I should rethink the tariff thing. Or I should rethink individual rights. That's also a possibility. Maybe I should rethink the tariff thing. Maybe there's a different solution. Or maybe I framed the problem wrong. Or maybe, maybe I'm listening to wrong people. Or maybe my facts are, are screwed up. And, and maybe what's going on here? That, that's the approach. I mean, confusion is a good thing. Confusion is a sign of a thinking, active mind. It's, it's when you take a story in a field that you know very little about and you know exactly what's right and what's wrong about it, that you should wonder, you should wonder whether you're truly being independent and whether you're truly being objective and whether you're truly being thoughtful. So what am I asking for? I'm asking for thoughtfulness. I'm asking for know what you know, for being objective about your own knowledge. I'm asking that before you comment on stuff, you evaluate. Seriously. Seriously. Thinking, evaluation, judging are serious activities. Whether you know what you're going to say is a fact or not, or whether you're just mouthing off on stuff you, have, you know very little or know something or have an indication or maybe know a little bit. But if you know a little bit, then why are you so confident? Maybe you should reduce the level of confidence. Just change your tone. So really what I'm asking here is for people to think. But, but to think, how do I say it? To think as objectivists. To think as people who are individualists. To think as people who, you know, really have a respect for reason and for individualism, and for freedom and liberty. As integrators, people have respect for their own mind and want to integrate all their knowledge, not just take things concretely out of context. Right? There's one guy who came on Facebook earlier, and the, uh, all he can say is make America great again. All right? What does that mean? Who, what is America? What does great mean? What's the context of greatness? In foreign policy, in domestic policy, how do you do it? Is anything, anybody, anybody in the political world today suggesting that would actually make America great again? I mean, really great? Founding fathers like great? Anybody out there saying anything that leads you to think that that's possible? that's the direction we would head in? Are there any ideas on the table that would make America great, founding fathers like great? Or, or, or 19th century like great? Post, put aside slavery, right? No, there isn't anybody. I don't care how much you love any particular politician. There's not a single politician out there who is actually making proposals in a, in a serious kind of way that would lead America to become great, not just a little bit better. Yeah, lots of people doing that. But great again. Yeah, but, but, but it doesn't matter, right? Because it makes you feel good to, to belong to some tribe uh, of, of, of people who chant a, a particular chant. And, and that has emotional appeal of being part of a group. But 
But that's not it being, an indep- being independent. It's not being a thinker. That's not taking ideas or words, concepts, seriously. If you want to take Make America Great seriously, break it down, figure out what it actually means, and then match it up against the policies of anybody in the political world today. And it's not going to go anywhere. You're not going to get anything. All right, we're into our last, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. If, if you have any questions, uh, 347-324-3075. And 347-324-3075. Now, that's the way I approach things. And that's why I often come to conclusions that many of you disagree with. Because I think I'm practicing independent thinking. I, I want to understand. I want to break it down. I want to see what's actually going on here. And I know many of you, many people out there, um, uh, well, forget, forget many people out there. And if you're an independent thinker and you evaluate the facts and you reach certain conclusions, then you're confident about those conclusions because you know they're based on facts. They're based on evidence. And I often express very confident, passionate views on these shows. Because I've had come to the conclusion that they are true through a process that's pretty rigorous, pretty rigorous, I might say. And I present the facts and evidence, and I'm not convincing. I'm often not convincing. I'm not convincing to the outside world, and I'm not convincing to the objectivist world. And I believe strongly, I believe strongly in something that most modern intellectuals don't believe in. All right, we're, we're going to do that. After we take a quick break, I'll tell you what it is that I believe that uh, most, most intellectuals out there don't believe in. If you're interested in going deeper into objectivism, ARI Campus's new advanced course, Objectivism Through Induction, answers central questions about several key values of Ayn Rand's revolutionary philosophy. Originally given by Leonard Peikoff in 1997, the course teaches you the method of learning objectivism's principles that Rand used to discover them. According to Dr. Peikoff, objectivism through induction is the best way I know of tying your ideas to reality and acquiring a real understanding of objectivism. Visit ARI campus today to enroll. Yeah, I mean, if you really want to study objectivism, that is your best source. The best source to study objectivism is ARI campus. It's Leonard Peikoff's courses get engaged, go take those courses and do it. And, and since I'm pitching, let me remind you, if you're listening to the show, I encourage you to support the show, support the show through patreon.com slash Iran Brook show. Um, make a contribution, $2 a month, $5 a month, $1,000 a month would be great. Whatever, whatever you think reflects the value that you get from the show. You're listening to it. Some of you listen to many of them. You listen to it maybe every week. That means it's valuable to you. Well, put your money where your mouth is. You don't want to be. That, that's what self-esteem demands. You, you, you pay for the values you receive. You don't have to. You can, you can free ride. That's fine. But out of the sense of self-respect, I would think you would want to actually contribute to the success of the show. All the money we raise through Patreon goes to our marketing efforts and to, uh, to our development of new products efforts at the Iran book show. So let me, let me tell you one thing that, uh, you know, I'm kind of a, uh, I believe in and that modern intellectuals don't believe in. And a lot of people in our modern culture don't believe in, and that is, I believe in moral judgment. I, I believe in calling it like it is. I believe in when somebody is immoral or somebody is bad, when something is evil, when something is wrong, I believe in calling it out. And, and uh, first of all, before calling it out, I believe in making the judgment, of course, being objective about it, making it fact-based. But then, if it's relevant, given that I'm a public intellectual, I believe in calling it out. So I'm going to call it the way I see it. You, don't, you know, some people don't like it. That's fine. But I'm going to call it the way I see it. I'm going to call bad people where I see them. I'm going to call evil where I see it. I'm going to call immorality where I see it. A lot of people got very upset at me. You know, that I, that I said that Marx, that Marx and uh, Kant were just as evil as Hitler and Stalin. And they are. Many people don't even want me to call Marx and Kant evil because they didn't hit anybody. 
They didn't rape anybody. They didn't sexually harass anybody, as far as we know. They, they lived, you know, peaceful lives. And evil, according to these people, is only in the physical realm. Well, that's not objectivism. And, and I encourage you to read an essay, um, an essay called uh, How to Live a, a Rational Life in an Irrational Society. And what is Ayn Rand, the one thing she singles out in that essay? The one thing she singles out is to morally judge people, events, actions, to morally judge, morally judge. And she articulates how to morally judge and how hard it is and how difficult it is and how much of a, of a challenge it is to judge, particularly other people. It's really, really hard. Dr. Peacock has also talked about that. But you got to do it because that's what your life requires. Your life requires judging people. And the good, because judging doesn't mean just by judging negatively. It means judging positively as well. The good is harmed when we don't speak up against evil. And the good pulled down when we don't speak up against evil. And your life, your life is harmed when evil benefits and the good is pulled down. So this is all egoistic. It's all selfish. It's about your life and to live your life fully and to live your life proudly and to live your life in a meaningful way. You have to judge but it's hard work and you have to do it it's part of living and it has to be independent you can't always trust other people judges you can't trust me to do the thinking for you don't my goal is not to do the thinking for you my goal is not to get you to agree with me my goal is to get you thinking my goal is to challenge your beliefs so you start thinking for yourselves to push you to challenge you to question you. But at the end of the day, each one of you has to do your own thinking, your own judging. Don't agree with me unless you really agree with me. All right. Um, if you're calling, because I see somebody's on the line, you have to press one to indicate to me that you actually want to ask a question. So uh, 347 324 we've got just about 10 minutes for questions. But if you want to ask a question, press 1 on your phone so that I know you want to ask that question. All right. Hi, you're on the Yuan Book Show. Who's this? This is Skylar again, Dr. Brooke. Oh, okay, you're back. What's up? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh Within the question that I asked about the you know women in the military, you said you rely on our instincts, and I always, and I I want to see if I've been mistaken. Do human beings have instincts? I know we don't have instincts to make a iPhone or. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I don't think I said instinct. But, I think I said intuition, but but intuitively, intuition, but maybe, yeah. yeah, but yeah, I mean, we we automatize certain things, and we automatize them so that they become second nature. And one of the things I think men automatize is the idea that they must protect women, uh, that the right. idea that, 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 that women are to be protected. And, and again, you know, some of it's biological and some of it's culture, cultural. And I think young men in the military, um, under fire, there's a girl next to them. She might be fully equipped with a rifle and everything else. I think that they have, that they automatic response is going to be protective, uh, or they're going to think twice about it at least, uh, in terms of putting her life at risk, whereas they wouldn't think twice if it was a male. So I just think it right. slows people down. It slows men down, uh, not because it's an instinct, but because that is the kind of thinking that we have integrated that now results in a particular emotion. Absolutely. In a particular intuition, if you will. And we all have intuitions. You can't deny intuition. Intuition is a sense of automatic, but not very instinct. fast. Making that, you're making that clarification. There's no, there's no instinct involved. There's intuition involved. Yes, and it's intuition means, okay. you know, again, uh, integra- uh, you know, a sum of integrated knowledge that now comes very quickly. I mean, I, mean, um, I think Coleman, the, 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 the evolutionary... Um, uh, economist talks about the fact, behavioral economist it talks about fast thinking. I mean, some people, if you're an expert at something, you don't have to spend hours thinking about certain problems. You can just look at them like if you're a chess master, 
and you know what the next move is. You just know. It just pops into your mind. You've trained your mind so well that it just comes to you without you actually experiencing the experience of thinking. And I think, I think, uh, um, uh, people who are experts in anything do that. Somebody sits down the piano and just plays, you drive a car, you just drive. Um, you, you don't think about the actions that you're taking, even though at some point you've had to have thought about it so that you can automatize the process. And I think a lot of, a lot of how we live is, is through these automatized, um, automatized, intuitions if you will now you want to be careful about them because they might be wrong so so you want to have some control over them but they do exist and particularly in emergencies we rely on them and uh, that's where I, I think this male female issue becomes an issue is is in an emergency when we have to rely on these fast immediate you know in, you know uh, intuitions or almost in almost instincts, but they're not instincts because they're not biologically in us. We have thought about them and integrate them into who we are, uh, that that it can be a problem. Does that make sense? Thanks again, Dr. Brooke. Appreciate it. Sure. My pleasure. Absolutely. All right. I I, I don't know if somebody calling from the 561 area code, if you are here to ask a question, then press the one button. Uh, because otherwise I have no idea. All right. Um, so we talked today about independent thinking. There's a lot to say about this. Um, I'm going to do a whole show on independence, on the virtue of independence. Um, I think uh, over time we'll do a, a whole show on each one of the virtues. But it's, it's, um, it's not obvious uh, how to do it, what to do, what are the kind of the concretes that, that one needs to engage in. But I think, as Leonard Peacock puts it, Independence means that your primary orientation is to reality, not to other people, not to your disagreement with other people or not to your agreement with other people, but what you're interested in are facts. What you're interested in is the truth. That's what it means to be an independent thinker. That's what it means to be independent as a human being, independent as a human being, both from a, a, a cognition perspective and an existential survival perspective. It's about this orientation um, and, and, and uh, the reliance on facts and evidence. Uh, and, uh, and when you morally judge, when you morally evaluate people, it's again, facts, evidence, and then judgment. We are judging beings. Judge and be willing to be judged. I think that that's a paraphrasing something from the New Testament that I think Ayn Rand liked uh, from the New Testament. So, uh, all right. Thank you all. Uh, Next week, I will be back home. Uh, So I'll be doing this from California, which means at the very least, the technological setup should be a lot better. We should have good video. We should have great audio. We should all be set. Uh, for next week, I'll probably be less tired than I am now because it's, uh, what is it now? It is almost 11 o'clock p.m. in Krakow time, a beautiful Krakow. Krakow is a beautiful city. It's, it's, it's one, of the, one of those cities in Europe that were not destroyed during the war. Warsaw was completely flattened. Many cities were completely flattened. Uh, uh, luckily, some cities survived and we get, uh, and we get the, the, the vibe and the, and the architecture of, uh, of a previous era, which is kind of cool to experience uh, periodically. So, uh, so I, I enjoy Krakow. Um, great company today and uh, good food. And I will talk to all of you uh, next week on Saturday, and we'll probably do a Living Objectivism episode. Uh, Saturday is the blaze, Living Objectivism Sunday. Um, and uh, don't forget to support the Iran Book Show on Patreon, and also you can go check out my new website, youronbrookshow.com. I've got a new website. It's cool. All right. Talk to you next week. Have a great week, everybody.